uh, Jeff Dyer, acclaimed essayist, novelist, and author of uh, Jeff in Venice, and four previous novels, as well as nine nonfiction books. His books have been translated into 24 languages. As many of his awards include the 2012 National Book Critics Circle Award and a 2015 Wyndham Campbell Prize for nonfiction. He is currently a writer in residence at the University of Southern California. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Dyer. Uh, well, thank you, Aaron. Thank you all for coming. How does that sound? We're all good? Louder. Okay. Uh, I'll do it the other way around. I'll put the mouth closer to the microphone. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, it's wonderful to be back here. I had a great time when I was at the festival. It, I was at the the festival before the one before uh, before uh, before there stopped being any festivals. Anyway, so um, in that time of COVID, uh, I wrote this new blockbuster, and I feel in this part of the world, you know, where as you drive from Los Angeles into Palm Springs and so forth, uh, I could be wrong, but I think there's probably the highest concentration of tennis courts in the world here. So on the assumption that there are some tennis fans here, I, I've got this very English urge to start by apologizing. You could reasonably assume from the title that this is a book about tennis. And um, the truth is, it's not. Um, I hoped uh, my, my agent, I asked him to, uh, to get in touch with Roger Federer to endorse the, the book. You know, it's something that happens. And uh, um, I thought, you know, he might say something. Because I, I get the sense that if I could just meet Roger, uh, and I, that's who he is to me, Roger. He's not Roger Federer. He's just Roger, because I... I mean, something strange happened about six years ago. I'd always loved Roger, and then about five or six years ago, I realized, God, I love him more than ever. And I think one of the reasons for this is because I felt that he had such a great sense of humor, and if we could, if we could ever meet, then uh, you know, I felt we'd become great friends. So I thought he might come up with this nice little endorsement some for the book, something like, oh, I thought there'd be more about me in it. <laughs> But uh, whereas an author like Salman Rushdie will happily, you know, provide an endorsement for a book saying it's, you know, a page turner or whatever, for these, a tennis player like Roger, endorsement means basically something that begins with negotiations upwards of a million dollars. So, uh, you know, that, 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 was, that was not going to happen. Um, so it's not about a uh, book about, uh, about tennis, and uh, I just want to say something about the, uh, the design of the book cover, really. I feel this title only works because uh, of this wonderful photograph, which makes it very clear that it's not going to be uh, a book just, uh, just about tennis. It's a book about last things, um, all sorts of last things, um, the last days of one's life, the sense of time running out. We're all very familiar with that extraordinary thing, that acceleration of time. You know, we can all remember being uh, when we were kids and those when an afternoon was this great, un often unendurable prairie expanse of time. Whereas now an afternoon, I mean, there's not time to get anything done in an afternoon, is there? And weirdly, uh, when I was mentioning this to uh, Coy, who many of you will know, a sort of moderator and a doctor here, he, uh, he really surprised me by, you know, we're, we're familiar with the way that uh, the reason time accelerates is because when you're from the age 10 to 11, that's a tenth of your life, whereas from, uh, say, 70 to 71, that's a mere 70th of your life. And Coy, rather bizarrely, said he likened this to the way that a toilet roll um, uh, uh, starts disappearing very, very rapidly. Um, uh, you can always rely on these doctors to, uh, to, to lower the tone like that. 
So it's about yeah, t time running out. Uh, th that's the most obvious thing. And also all the attendant sort of ailments that, that go with that. And one of the things that I address in this book, I, I have this, I don't know about you, but I have this great aversion to these uh, novels which advertise themselves like this. Uh, it's a day or a night or an afternoon that will change their lives forever. You know that kind of genre of, of advertisement for a book? And, you know, it's always, of course, something dramatic. We can think of, uh, like, the home invasion in uh, Ian McEwan's Saturday, for example, something like that. And, of course, terrible things can happen that change one's life uh, for, forever. But actually, I think one of the things that's greatly, that's sort of very interesting is the opposite of these sudden changes, the way that things happen so gradually, so gradually as to often be unnoticeable. Uh, so it's a book about this, uh, this, this process of, of, of gradual change. And it's about also uh, the way that um, the careers of athletes and writers, artists, musicians come to an end. And here I think it's useful for me to make a, a somewhat of a distinction. A lot of work has been done about so-called late style. That is, to say, that is to say, the style that an artist or writer or musician arrives at late in their lives. So the classic example of this is, of course, Beethoven. You know, it's widely agreed there are three distinct phases in, in Beethoven's uh, career, early, middle, and late. And uh, in, the, in, in the case of Beethoven, of course, it, it makes sense. His late period comes late in his life. But I think what is quite interesting when we start considering uh, people's last works is that people's last works don't always come late in their lives. Uh, in, in Beethoven's case, it happens. His last works are also his late works, but it doesn't take very much thought at all to um, uh, consider writers whose last work is also, hmm, their first work. You know, you can think of these writers who they write one book um, and they never write another one. It can be for all sorts of reasons. It can, uh, I mean, yeah, there's loads of reasons. It can, because, can be because they've had the misfortune, or the good fortune, rather, to enjoy what's called in the military catastrophic early success. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's a tricky balance being a, a, a writer, really, that balance between having enough money, uh, because if you haven't got any money at all, you can't carry on, you have to uh, get another job. But on the other hand, if you get too much money too soon, then that, uh, you lose that crucial lash of, uh, of economic incentives. Or alternatively, I think it can happen that some people do, you know, their first book is their last book. In a way, I think people who really venerate the idea of literature and being a writer, it can afflict them because, you know, they, they want to be a writer so much and then they achieve this by publishing a book and that's, that, that's it, that's, that's done it for them. So there's, there's just all sorts of ways in which uh, uh, people's... Uh, Lit, uh, creative careers can, uh, can come to an end. There was a time, and I was quite interested in this, when it seemed to me, by a weird sort of actuarial fluke, that typically one's career as a novelist would tend to start at roughly the time that your career as an athlete was coming to an end. Because typically you would publish a first novel when you were 30, of something like 30. Of course, there are exceptions. We can think of people who publish their first novel much later, or we can think of precocious people like Zadie Smith. Or uh, yeah, Zadie Smith is a good example who published her first novel, I think, when she was 23. But let's say 30 was pretty, pretty, uh, pretty sort of normal. And I always thought that was a, just the most wonderful uh, life you could have, i.e., to be an athlete. Uh, up until you were in your late 20s, and then to embark on this uh, life as a novelist, but it, uh, it, uh, it doesn't work like that. Um, we can, if you think of someone like Bjorn Borg, who uh, you know, retired from uh, professional tennis for all sorts of reasons very early, 
And then you've got this kind of very, very difficult situation. I think he was about 26 when he retired. You know, what are you going to do uh, w with the rest of your life? You retire because, uh, often because you've come to hate the thing that you, uh, the, the thing that you were famous for, the thing that you were loved, that you loved. Um, and, you know, then you've got this kind of extraordinarily difficult situation. You've got the rest of your life in front of you. And maybe everything that uh, made you successful as an athlete almost guaranteed that the rest of your life would be uh, uh, a problem. And, you know, you think of um, uh, uh, Bjorn Borg, uh, a really sort of um, uh, kind of sad example, really. You know, what did, what did Bjorn Borg do when he retired? Well, one of the first things he did was to judge a wet T-shirt contest. <laughs> And you think this is, uh, you know, well, that's quite fun. But, uh, you know, uh, it was a lot of fun for him because he was then involved in a paternity suit with uh, the winner of, of this wet T-shirt uh, competition. But, I mean, I think what, and of course, so, you know, okay, you judge one wet T-shirt competition, maybe two, and, you know, you do a few things like that. And then you realize, God, actually, there's got to be more, uh, more to life than this. So what do you do? Well, you make a comeback. And the comeback, you know, you can, we've seen, I mean, and, and in fact, Bjorn Borg, I mean, I, I mentioned him, but, you know, the list of boxers who've had a, a, a ter terrible experience having, uh, having uh, retired from the ring is, is very lengthy. Uh, bankruptcy is, 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 is quite, the, quite the norm. Anyway, so it's a, it's a really, it's a really, uh, um, it's a really poignant and often rather sad thing. And I think, you know, recently, was it, just, was it just this week or last week that Boris Becker, you know, uh, ends up in jail in this bankruptcy thing? And of course, it's really, it's easy to see Boris Becker as a slightly, uh, slightly ludicrous uh, figure, another victim of a, I say victim, another um, uh, recipient of a paternity suit from that, uh, that famous occasion in the cupboard of a of a London restaurant with somebody he'd only met five minutes earlier. Um, and yeah, uh, I saw Boris Becker just once about three years ago coming out of the restroom near centre, the centre court of, uh, of Wimbledon uh, in really terrible shape. I mean, uh, like so many, uh, tennis is so physically demanding, so grueling. You remember Becker when he was young, he would fling himself all over these, these hard courts and as he sort of shouldered his way out of this restroom, I realized, oh my God, he's having real trouble walking. I realized, God, I could probably beat him at tennis actually now, <laughs> uh, even though I'm older than him. And, you know, and it's, uh, you'll remember as part of his uh, attempt to ward off um, uh, um, prosecution or whatever it should be called for bankruptcy, he claimed at one point that he, had, uh, he was an attache for the Democratic Republic, Republic of Congo. Um, so it was a ludicrous, you know, his life had become, he'd become a kind of ridiculous figure. But, you know, the fact remains, he'd won Wimbledon three times by the time he was, what, 22, 23? And it seems to me, God, that's a great life. There's just this problem of what you're going to do with your life in the aftermath of that. And one of the things I've become convinced of is that the value of a life can't be assessed chronologically. It's not that the only part of your life that happens is the five minutes or the five years before you're on your deathbed. And I think it's this, so we can think of many examples of really great lives which have maybe... 40, 30, 20, or 10 years of uh, just where you're living in the wake of your, your legend, really. I think, for example, of uh, uh, Jack Kerouac. Um, I find Kerouac's life incredibly moving, actually. I mean, let's look at it, let's do it in sort of reverse order. We've probably all seen the, that sort of footage of him on these TV shows. When he's He's about, uh, maybe let's say, I can't remember exactly how old he was when he, when he died. Let's say he's in his 40s and he's a bloated, rather silly drunk. Uh, and he's become, you know, incredibly reactionary. He sort of turned on many of the, the friends that he was uh, part, of the, part of that sort of, you know, that, that beat generation. And yeah, he became a kind of buffoon, really. Um, and, 
you know, extraordinarily, the king of the beats ends up living with his mum. Uh, but then, you know, as we, as we go back into his life, then, uh, you know, we think of that time when he's, uh, uh, after many years of rejection, On the Road is, is uh, finally, finally published. And there's a review of, of it in the, the New York Times, and it becomes a huge success, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a sort of wonderful thing. Now we go back to that period before it's published, and he'd staked everything on On the Road. And there's a, a letter that he writes to one of his friends, I think it's as early as about 1952, so maybe something like eight years before, maybe six or seven years before On the Road is finally published. Uh, and it's been rejected by everybody. And he says, you know, I know what will happen. On the Road will eventually be, covered, be, be published with a, a few with a few changes and a few improvements, a bit of editing, and it will then take its place as one, one of the first sort of new great American novels. And it, you know, that, that comes true. And it seems to me that uh, the great triumph of that, the way that Kerouac staked everything on um, this being uh, a great novel, the fact that he, after the publication of uh, On the Road, Uh, nothing that came out was was that good. Nothing can invalidate the sort of scale of that victory of his. And it's a complicated thing for Kerouac because I think what happened, as you're, you're all familiar with that story of how the first draft, one of the versions of On the Road, was written in a kind of benzedrine fever on that great long scroll of, uh, of, of, of paper. But it's not quite true. I mean, he, I mean what... Uh, He had this great commitment, as you know, to this idea of spontaneous prose, of not, not revising his work. But actually, as we look more closely, we see that he did do a lot of work on that scroll. Uh, he kept revising on the road in order to make it look more spontaneous. Uh, so there was, he was really quite sedulous as a, as a, as a writer in that regard. And it just, it seems to me that what happened, and he says this in his letters himself, that he became sort of imprisoned in this kind of idea of, uh, of spontaneous prose. And as he himself said, you know, he was so trapped in this that it sort of, it, that way of writing had lost that crucial element of spontaneity. So now we get into this other uh, realm of, uh, you know, so for, a, for an athlete, you, you give up your sport, um, And, you know, you, what do you do? Well, uh, well, let's think of uh, rock stars. You know, I think there's this, uh, you know, I remember I was in uh, South Korea on a journalistic gig uh, when I was doing a sort of a piece on, uh, on uh, that, uh, that, that awful band Def Leppard. And that's when I became very, very familiar with the life of a kind of uh, 45-year-old or 50-year-old rock star, which uh, a, day, a day in the life of a rock star of that age typically consists of a round of golf and an AA meeting. <laughs> um, so um, uh, that's, uh, that's a sort of extreme example, but there, it's diff different with writers. You keep on, you keep on writing, and, um, you know, there is the... I mean, Billy Collins is always very, very funny about this, about being a poet. I think he's speaking here maybe next, next year or the, the year after. He says, yeah, well, the main thing, the main difficulty with being a poet is what to do with the other 23 and a half hours of the day. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, uh, as writers, you, you sort of uh, keep writing. And I think then there is this problem of, uh, you know, what you're, what you're going to write about. And there is this terrible temptation, this tendency towards, this is a phrase I've used before, but I think it's very good, whereby um, you can keep writing, but there's, there's two risks. One is the great risk that you'll succumb to a form of self-karaoke, uh, whereby, like a sort of rock band, you become your own tribute act. Uh, and then there is the other thing that uh, you actually, in order for you to continue uh, your writing, you have to become oblivious to what's so clear to your readers, namely that, oh, it's not nearly as good as it used to be. And I think those of you who've seen that very, very uh, poignant uh, uh, Ken Burns series on Hemingway, you know, there's that um, uh, uh, passage in it where he writes to his editor, I think he's writing, 
I can't remember the name of the book he's writing, but he writes to a, his editor saying that he's, uh, he's writing like a 25-year-old again. And it's true, he's, got the, he's writing at the momentum, he's got the speed that he had as, had as a 25-year-old, but his ability to control the quality of it, a condition of his doing that is that he's oblivious to the, to the decline in, in quality. So all of the, there, are, there are all manner of, of hazards. So these are some of the things I, I address in the book. But I also talk about things that, we, that one experiences, uh, that what experiences one has um, uh, as one's getting older. So, you know, as you know, it's as a writer, your ability to keep writing is also so dependent actually on the fuel of reading. So there's this um, rather strange thing really, I don't know if it's, uh, I always have this great faith really that uh, if I've experienced something then the chances are other people have as well. So I mean it always uh, amazed, I remember when I, when, you know, when I was young, you know, when I was let's say 20 in in England. What did I want to do? Well, of course, I wanted to be out drinking in the pub the whole time, but I also liked reading. And I had this vision of uh, when I was older and less keen on going out boozing the whole time, then I would uh, spend more time reading. And a strange thing is, though, that I realized that back then, when I was in my late teens or early 20s, I had the capacity and the discipline to finish books even if I wasn't enjoying them at all, because I felt that in some way I was going to benefit from them. So I slogged through every, I slogged through The Idiot by Dostoevsky, even though I actually hated every single page of it. <laughs> but I had a kind of stamina, I had an ability to get to the end of things that I, I seem to have lost now. I just don't have that discipline. So, I mean, one you know, uh, it's, uh, I'm very conscious. I don't want to go to my grave without having read Proust. I really don't want to. But I'm also feeling that, God, the chances of my having read Proust were greater 20 years ago than they are now. Uh, and there's all sorts of examples of this. You know, I look at, uh, I picked up uh, Light in August by Faulkner the other day. I thought, and then uh, as I was reading it, I came across uh, these sort of pencil marks in the margin, which uh, suggested, well, they proved that I'd read it before. I had absolutely <laughs> no, memory, no memory of it. Um, but uh, this, but uh, so yeah, I just, I just didn't have the the stamina. I just didn't have the chops to to, to get through it. So this is one of those sort of strange, uh, strange pa paradoxes. Uh, I think the idea. I mean, weirdly, one is better able to get through difficult books when one is less uh, accomplished as a as, as a reader. Um, and it's a it's a very it's a strange and and troubling thing, uh, I think. Um, there's all sorts of other stuff uh, I address in, in, uh, in the book. And of course, there's, as you would expect, I mean, I, I really, I was at great pains to make sure that the book didn't become an injury journal or a sprain diary. But of course, there's inevitably a certain amount of stuff in the book about my aching knees and all this kind of stuff. And it's, uh, it's, um, I mean, I feel I'm now deep in the twilight of my tennis, uh, my, my tennis career, if I can, if I can dignify it with, with, uh, with, with that word. And it's a, it's a strange thing. I mean, I don't. I mean, on the one, it's yeah, it's a very strange thing because um, let's suppose I play typically tennis for four hours a week. I mean, that's. That's only you know four hours. It's it, it's nothing. I spend much. I, pro I spend more time in a cafe drinking coffee than I do playing tennis. But those four hours playing tennis, the glow of that spreads throughout the week. So it's one of the most important sources of happiness for me. But that's actually changing because increasingly. I feel, and I look back to a time in my 20s, I can remember this so clearly when I played 90 minutes of soccer, then I played three sets of tennis, and then uh, maybe an hour and a half of ping pong, and I felt sort of okay. Whereas now increasingly, this experience of tennis, which I so love, it leaves me so utterly wrung out and depleted. 
that I'm starting to wonder, is it, sort of, is, it, is it worth it, actually? Is the ache and the exhaustion, is it really, is, te am I on the br is tennis on the brink of uh, becoming something I used to do, I used to like doing? And I'll just mention something else that I used to like doing. Uh, I used to love, I, I didn't just love smoking marijuana, I thought it was just one of the things in my life that I would never stop liking. It was so useful for me creatively. There'd be all sorts of occasions when I couldn't think of something to write and then marijuana would... Uh, I mean, Thomas Pynchon calls it rather brilliantly that useful substance and it really was useful. Anyway, then I moved to California and of course, you know, marijuana was legalized so you could go into a store and see a, see a doctor and this doctor, of course, Unlike our friend Coy, who's a great advert for the medical profession, this so-called doctor would often not be such a great advert for the uh, 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 helpful effects of, of marijuana. You'd go in there and say something like, I don't know, I can't sleep or I can't stay awake or, God, I've lost my left slipper or something like this. <laughs> and he'd write you a prescription for medical marijuana. And that was all sort of great. And then, of course, the, even that... Uh, pretext was got, and you could just go into a place and buy it, and it was all great. But then uh, I found that, and this is something also I think I share with, I found that um, uh, uh, I just, I found, first of all, that I didn't like smoking marijuana anymore at a time which was, which was really conducive to it. And of course, of course, now you don't even have to smoke it. I always hated that. You can just sort of vaporize it. But I found I didn't like the effects. And then also I found that it was more extreme than that. I became, I went from not liking using marijuana myself personally, because on the occasions I did, always after a few minutes, I'd have this overwhelming desire, which was to be not stoned. Um, because I think what happened is, as I think you're all familiar with this, you know, the marijuana that's around now, it bears no relation at all to, to what it used to be. It just seems to me this, uh, it's just like a, uh, it seems to me it's like a, I don't know, a, a premonition of traumatic head, uh, head injury. Uh, and I found that I'd gone from being sort of not liking it to actually being hostile to it. And I now, as I cycled to the tennis courts in Venice Beach, I just hate the way the smell of this super strong marijuana pervades everything. So that's another sort of change that, uh, that, that, uh, that, uh, that comes about. So it, the, this book deals with all of these kind of... Uh, all of these things in this phase of my life. And um, although Jamie kind of lectured me beforehand, saying that uh, we, you know, people don't like readings at these, uh, at, at these events, I thought it would be a good idea to, to give you a little sense of uh, what, the, what the book is like. Because, um, well, because, you know, it's, uh, it, this is, I mean, part of the pleasures of the, uh, one of the pleasures of the, this book, I think, is the unfurling of the, the writer's consciousness. So I'm going to read you just a couple of short passages which uh, give you a sense of its range, uh, I, I think. And I hope this will be, oh yeah, this will be, I go back to, uh, uh, I deal with this idea of uh, when I first became interested in this idea of things ending. So I'll read this, this little passage. In my last year at Oxford, unsure what I might do after graduating, I made a few half-hearted applications for post-grad studies. Not because I wanted to set out on the long, dreary, and utterly pointless slog of a doctorate, but as a way of postponing the need to embark on the life of being something other than a student. The only thing I could think of proposing as a possible area of research was how novels end. If this seemed like an under-researched area, that was because I'd not researched it at all. <laughs> there was no theoretical underpinning or framing. I had no idea what this project might be expected to un uncover, and I can't remember anything of substance that my so-called proposal contained. I'd heard of, but not read, Frank Commode's The Sense of an Ending, and I mentioned Great Expectations with its revised and ambiguous ending. I might even have suggested that this represented some kind of turning point in the history or development of something or other, but I was not interested in making a contribution to knowledge. What I was interested in was getting a grant. 
To this end, I took a train to Birmingham where I had a meeting with David Lodge, who was surprisingly encouraging, and I applied to a university in Canada, but everything fizzled out before it had even properly fizzed. With my formal education and academic aspirations at an end, I drifted into the life of unsupervised and unfocused study to which I was perfectly suited. <laughs> Signing on the doll, reading a lot, listening to, the mu to music, going to the cinema, and drinking beer. Gradually, I weaned myself off the, do off the doll, but essentially my life has continued on the same trajectory, a trajectory, if such a thing is possible, without direction or purpose, ever since. Well, I say that, but then I realize that there are so many little things that substitute for the lack of a larger goal that continue to crop up in the course of one's journey through life. I put it ponderously like that because what I have in mind is something like the ambition, conceived as I turn 60, of never buying shampoo again. <laughs> I don't mean giving up washing my hair. I mean not paying for shampoo. I can afford to buy shampoo. I've got the cash to go out to CVS right now and buy it by the crate load, but I prefer to filch bottles from hotels. <laughs> That's how it started, modestly enough, but then my wife and I were in a hotel in Marfa, Texas, where instead of little bottles of shampoo, a large dispenser of high-quality product was fixed to the wall. It so happened that we'd bought our, brought our selection of daily vitamins in a glucosamine container, so we pumped the contents of the dispenser <laughs> into that and made off with four times the amount of shampoo we would happily have settled for had they, not, had they not tried to stop us taking any at all. I'm getting the distinct impression that I'm not the only person who's... Uh... Thereafter, we always traveled with a couple of empty containers and came to hope that there might be a dispenser rather than a selection of little bottles. We were held in check by the 100 mil limit imposed by airlines on liquids in hand luggage but on one occasion, we drove back from the Skyview Hotel in Los Alamos, the town in California, not the home of the Manhattan Project, with two water bottles of shampoo and conditioner. That's when things really took off. We soon had enough shampoo to open a salon. It was a good feeling knowing we had this product reservoir. I liked opening the under-sink cupboard in the bathroom and looking at the mix of original sample bottles from Bigelow and the confusing array of vitamin containers we de decanted the shampoo into. But what I really liked was the ongoing project of constantly accumulating more and more shampoo. We had rules and we had everything under control. If we were invited to a friend's house for dinner, we never took along an empty aspirin bottle. <laughs> so that we could siphon off some Avida shampoo while using their bathroom. But within a year, this incremental project had acquired the form of a grander ambition, never to buy shampoo again. This was now a quasi pharaonic undertaking, not a life's work exactly, but something I would continue doing for the rest of my days. I've used the first person plural throughout this account, but in truth, my wife, although happy to squirrel away shampoo, never committed to it with anything like my single-minded zeal. There were three reasons for this. One, she has a fulfilling job that occupies a large part of her consciousness. <laughs> Two, a slight propensity for scalp eczema means she likes to buy Nizaral, unbelievably expensive to keep this at bay, and three, after getting into a protracted lather about her hell, hair smelling fishy, she discovered that I'd left a capsule of omega-3 oil at the bottom <laughs> of one of our shampoo containers. <laughs> like so much else, this admirable mission was brought to an end by the coronavirus pandemic, also in three ways. With all trips canceled, I was unable to top up our supply of shampoo, I was always having to wash my hair at home rather than at the hairdressers when I was having it cut or in hotels, and the fact that I was unable to get a haircut meant that as it grew longer, I was having to wash it twice rather than once a week. As coronavirus hardships go, this barely merits a mention. The financial impact of having to buy shampoo is incalculably small, but I mention it precisely because it's not worth mentioning. 
The shampoo project was one of the things that had made my life enjoyable and worthwhile and gave it a purpose that was suddenly either taken away or made to seem entirely pointless. There were lots of things like this, and now almost all of them are gone. I've never had any big goals, ambitions, or dreams, but I've always had so many little scams, schemes, dodges, hobbies, and interests on the go that I've never felt the lack of a larger purpose or the need for a loftier consolation. That the most profound mind might almost be the most frivolous one was, said Nietzsche, almost a formula for his philosophy. One of the most profound minds of our time, Annie Dillard, has voiced her disappointment with philosophy's failure to address what she calls ultimate concerns, most of which can, in her opinion, be boiled down to a single question. What in the Sam Hill is going on here? That was my alarm to remind me I've got only five minutes left. <laughs> in its homely way, that does in indeed sound like a big question, but bear in mind that as a young graduate student, student, Dillard devoted much thought to Thoreau's Walden, trying to work out what kind of book it was. At one point, she decided it was really a book about a pond. My shampoo ambition might seem pond-like, like pond life behavior, and it was in a way, but it was one thread among many that taken together formed a net, the gain of which was so huge as not only to be life enhancing, but life defining. So although we came back from Martha, Martha with both a pot of shampoo and a new project of obsessive shampoo acquisition, we didn't go there for the shampoo. That would have been pathetic. <laughs> We went because we needed a few extra tier points to maintain our gold status with BA and found we could do this by taking just one more flight from Los Angeles to El Paso. It's not just shampoo or air miles and it's not just me. That's the whole point of and justification for writing about yourself. Indulged in conscientiously with sufficient rigor, it's never just about you. Take tennis players and towels. Or to rephrase that slightly, Watch them take towels at the end of a match. For the low-ranked or qualifiers, getting into a slam represents a rare and much-needed towel bonanza. But even the top players make sure after strapping on their sponsored watches in full view of the TV cameras to scoop up as many towels as possible before trudging off court. Pre-COVID, they would toss their disgusting, sweaty wristbands into the crowd and occasionally throw in a towel for good measure, but most of the time they'd make their exit looking as if they'd just finished looting a branch of bed, bath and beyond. <laughs> it's possible that after showering, they dumped the odd dirty towel in the locker room laundry basket, but I suspect that they regularly head back to the hotel and then the airport with bags stuffed full of towel swag. They're multi-millionaires, many of them, but they've still got their eye on the main towel chance, especially, especially if they lose and are in need of all the tear-absorbent consolation they can get their hands on. It's a perk, an athletic leftover from the ethically unquestioned heyday of imperial plunder. Any successful player has a trophy cabinet. Roger and Serena probably have designated towel rooms, maybe even separate towel houses. Like the great aristocratic families who take pains to ensure that generations of offspring will continue to enjoy the unearned benefits of inherited land, the titans of the ter tennis meritocracy bequeath to their ch children and grandchildren lives freed forever from the realm of toweling necessity. Um, We'll move on to questions very shortly, but I'm just going to read you one more very, very uh, short passage, and you'll see why. At any poetry reading, however enjoyable, the words we most look forward to hearing are always the same. I'll read two more poems. <laughs> the words we truly long for are I'll read one more poem, but two seems to be the conventionally agreed minimum. It's lovely hearing this. 
you can feel a sigh of relief passing through the audience, especially if the previous couple of poems have been precedent-setting sonnets clocking in at under a minute each. After long months in the sea of poetry, the shout has gone up from the crow's nest. Land! We're almost there. We've made it. Can practically taste the scurvy healing lager being poured in the bar afterwards. But then these two last poems turn out to be the opposite of the sonnets that had served as a double false dawn before the concluding multi-part epics. The felt duration of each is twice as long as Robert Browning's 400-page poem, The Ring and the Book. Which raises a question. Why did we come if, while being here, we would end up being so preoccupied by no longer being here? Could it be that our deepest desire is for everything to be over with. We want encores, value for money, bang for our buck. But however vigorously we've been clapping and clamoring for more, there is invariably a sense of relief when it becomes clear that the band, despite our collective imploring, are not coming back, that the house lights are flicked on, bringing the last residue of applause to an immediate, slightly impolite halt, and that we can apply ourselves single-mindedly to getting a good place in the stampede for the exit. Well, thank you for not stampeding straight away, but... Uh, uh, if there are some, uh, any questions, or if anyone else would like to confess to their shampoo uh, <laughs> stealing ways, then please do, uh, I'll endeavor to ask them. And I think there are microphones uh, around. So, so how did you decide to write this book? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's, uh, thank you for, for asking the question that I should have answered in my... Yeah, yeah. Um, well, do you know, it was... Um, the. Well, uh, yeah, I guess it depends how far we want to go back. I mean, when I was, uh, when I was about 14, this, the most famous player, football, soccer player in Britain, George Best, uh, retired from, from football, and it was, uh, I was on a camping trip at the time, and this was amazing. He was only about 26, so it was just this extraordinary sort of thing that somebody should give up doing this thing that they were great at, that they were loved for, uh, and uh, yeah, it just seemed it was so. I was conscious of this thing of uh, you know of uh, so that's the, the sort of distant answer. The the immediate thing, I guess, it was um, I think it was the 2017. One, lo one loses track of time. Maybe 2019 Australian Open when Andy Murray gave that uh, press conference uh, announcing his retirement because you know he said he just couldn't uh, he just couldn't take the the pain of. Uh, uh, not the pain of playing tennis, but the pain of pulling his socks on in, in the morning. And, you know, I mean, these athletes, they're interesting. I mean, there are some who, who do have, uh, you know, there are some who are keen readers. You know, we'll always remember Jim Courier famously reading that Amistad Mopin book in, in the middle of a match, uh, which suggested actually that maybe his time on the tour was drawing to a close because <laughs> he wasn't as focused as he should be. But... You know, this was a terrible thing for um, Murray because I think, you know, what it, you know, it was just tennis where he was, it was everything uh, uh, for him. And um, as I was watching that press conference, um, you know, this line of the doors floated into my head from the end, you know, lost in a Roman wilderness of pain. And uh, um, then I was struck by the way that, uh, you know, the end, that famous, justly famous song by The Doors, you know, it was the last track on their first album. So that's when I became interested in this relationship between, uh, this relationship, this question of when things start ending and this case of things uh, ending, uh, you know, right at the, at the beginning. And sure enough, you know, Jim Morrison didn't, you know, he, uh, you know, he crashed and burned very quickly. But I guess... When Andy Murray retired, you know, he was younger than, he was the first of the big four male players to, to, um, to retire. And there was already that sense then of us being in the twilight of, of, of Roger's um, uh, career. And I think 
for many of us, I mean, those of us who loved Roger, there was the, the sense of this, I mean, part of the sort of majesty of, of watching Roger Federer, I think it could be reduced to something quite simple, really, that he demonstrated that the most efficient way to play tennis, for a while, was also the most beautiful. And I think that's a rare thing that happens in sport because typically there's a, um, the, 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 the pragmatic and the aesthetic uh, are often pulling each other in different directions. So that, you know, as we all know, sport is not a beauty contest, it's about winning. And we can all think of soccer matches, for example, where a team has won by deliberately, sort of, by playing in a very boring way. So I think it was at that point that, uh, that, that I was thinking about that and just becoming conscious that, um, uh, you know, that I... Uh, um, this sort of well, the becoming conscious of um, that I was getting older, and I, I mean, this wonderful line, I can't remember who said it now, but um, uh, somebody said it to a poet, said to Paul Auster, he said about growing old, he said, Oh, it's the funniest thing to happen to a little boy, isn't it? <laughs> um, and so it was, it was that sort of combination of the autobiographical and these things, uh, these things going on. Thank you for getting the ball rolling there. While you're speaking, you remind me of something I always thought was sort of strange. In the New York Times, when they would interview authors about books that they've written, when I was younger, they'd, they'd always ask the same, I thought, crazy question. What do you have on your bedside table? Oh, yeah. What are you reading? And when I was younger, I thought that was really interesting because maybe, you know, I'm missing something. I should look into those books. Now I hear them. You know, they tell you the books. I said, I never heard of those authors. <laughs> How important could they be, and what, who, why do I care? So it just reminds me of how I've changed my attitude as I've gotten younger. Yeah. And uh, I thought and you were going to think about some of the questions that are asked of authors in general. I thought you were going to say something really quite pitiful then. I thought you were going to say... What, what, do you, um, what do you have on your bed? No, I thought you were going to say that, uh, you know, you really wished you had, you, you sort of aspired to having a bedside cabinet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but, uh, yeah, oh, I've, like all authors, I've got a great stack of books getting dusty by my bedside. What do you think about the non-ending for Tiger? The non-ending for ti yeah. Tiger? Yeah, well, everybody thought Tiger was ended. Yeah, and yeah. And what do you think about him going back? Yes, and yeah, you know. It's, um, well, um, uh, you know, it's one of the most disproved lines of all time, I think, is Scott Fitzgerald's, you know, there are no second acts in American lives. My God, there are second, third, fourth, fifth acts, you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, because I have zero interest in, in golf, I can't really comment on uh, on uh, on uh, Tiger Woods, but uh, in Britain, uh, uh, somebody I think I think it's Ronnie O'Sullivan has just won the World Snooker Championship for the seventh time, and he's in his I think he's about 46 now, and I'm guessing although I mean. Golf is more of a sport than snooker. I always liked that famous distinction between a, a sport and a game. I can't remember who said it now. Maybe it was Michael Parkinson who said, uh, the difference between a sport and a game, a ga if, you can play it, if you can play it while smoking, it's a game. <laughs> uh, and if, you know, so... Uh, uh, golf is clearly a sport, but it's always been, uh, the careers of golfers have always been, uh, they've always had more longevity than, say, uh, uh, soccer players. Uh, but I, I just don't know about Tiger Woods. I did at least recognize the name. <laughs> He, he did a what? Uh, uh, yeah, I gather he is. It's funny, though, uh, with... Um, yeah, uh, Murray, he's... Uh, God, it's... Yeah, I just... Uh, it's funny with... Um, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, he, he really... I mean, he so rarely looks like he's enjoying playing tennis, but he's, uh, you know... Uh, 
Yeah, he keeps, keeps grinding away. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry, ma'am. Um, I'm going to switch gears just for a moment. Um, many years ago, you wrote a, a book about uh, the Somme in World War I. Oh, yeah. And I was wondering what motivated you to write that book. Oh, yeah. So this is a book I wrote about uh, uh, the, the First World War, although it's not a history book. It's about the way the First World War is uh, remembered. And uh, yeah, I'm conscious of the way that when I was in American bookstores, there would be a, there'd be a section devoted, of course, to the American Civil War, and then maybe there'd be you know, a few books on the Spanish Civil War, perhaps, and then the Second World War, of course. And the, the First World War is such a huge thing in British consciousness in the way that it's really, uh, it really sort of, uh, it's not, it doesn't occupy the same um, part of the collective consciousness that it does here. So it was, you know, my, I mention this only because it's so, uh, it's so typical. So my grandfather was um, in the, uh, in the First World War and uh, it was, uh, you know, it was one of the uh, things that he was always uh, sort of would talk about, and I can remember this so vividly, I think I talked about this when I was at the festival, going round to my friend Gary Hunt, I was born in 1958, and we'd go round to my friend Gary Hunt's house, and his grandfather, this is when we were about seven, so this would be in, in about, say, 1964, something like this, his grandfather would regularly drop his trousers to show us his shrapnel wounds from the, <laughs> from the First World War, and I mentioned that only because that shows how that event was within, was part of living, uh, really part of uh, lived experience. You know, it hadn't just, it hadn't, it hadn't become uh, purely in the realm of memory, and now it's not even in the realm of memory, it's in the realm of, of history. Um, and I was in, um, uh, living in Paris, trying to write a novel, and then one day I went up to visit the, uh, the cemeteries, the First World War cemeteries, and I just wasn't prepared for the um, overwhelming um, impact of going to the, um, the, the main uh, British uh, memorial there, where in these huge letters on this memorial, it says the missing of the Somme. Um, and I started to think about, you know, what, what had drawn me here um, uh, to, this, to this place, and also, what was the baggage I brought with me, historical, familial, and, and cultural? So it was an investigation of, of that, really, the way that the First World War has, um, has in, endured in, in, the, in the sort of, uh, yeah, endured in, uh, in, in, in my consciousness. And again, it's like that. It's a more serious version of that shampoo piece I read. I felt that if I was to articulate very with great fidelity and care my own feelings uh, about the First World War, the chances are they would be, be shared by, uh, by, 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 by other people. So that's what, was, that was, that's what was going on there. Thank you for asking about, about that book. Uh, yes, sir. Do you know, I haven't, yeah, you know. Uh, that, uh, that, and the, that and golf are still some way some way off, yeah. So Jeff, on uh, behalf of the Ranch Mirage Writers Festival, uh, those in attendance, those watching online, we want to thank you. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs>